At this time, I would like to introduce UCLA's Dean of Humanities, Professor David Skaberg. Dean Skaberg is a scholar of ancient Chinese, Greek, and Latin literature. Since coming to UCLA in 1996, he has published an award-winning book and numerous articles on early Chinese historical writing, literature, philosophy, and oratory. Most recently, he has completed a translation with two collaborators of China's first great historical work, the Tsuo Zhuan. He has served as co-director of the Center for Chinese Studies and chair of the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures and was proud to receive the UCLA Staff Assembly Faculty Staff Partnership Award in 2011. Please join me in welcoming the Dean of the Division of Humanities, Professor David Skaberg. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to say just a few words about what you, our graduates in humanities, have accomplished and what you've prepared yourselves for. One way to think about what you're doing is to imagine yourselves as haunted. Uh, I mean, look around you. It's at commencement time that we show how frankly medieval we are in some of the things we do. On stage with me, you see men and women in medieval costume. <laughs> it's not exactly a uniform, since in our, in our different colors and our, our hoods and our funny hats, we're representing the different institutions where we earned our PhDs, and with them, the privilege of teaching students like you. We are certainly haunted by the long traditions of scholarship that brought us to this point, as are you. And we're sitting in a most medieval space, the ceremonial center of this campus, a building that recalls both the founding of UCLA nearly a century ago and UCLA's ties to medieval Italy and to the birth of universities a thousand years ago. I trust that you will return to Royce Hall many times in your lives, whether to keep alive the traditions of performing arts that flourish here or to receive a more advanced degree or perhaps someday to sit on stage with us in your own medieval costumes. Students, humanists, you're haunted and you chose it for yourselves, just as we did. You are yet another generation who could not help listening to voices from the other side, to the thoughts that our most distant ancestors and our most distant contemporaries have committed to writing, to the music and the art that they just had to make. And every one of you has been troubled by some question of understanding that legacy. Why does language work the way it does? What truths are we capable of knowing? What do those distant people mean? If you've ever loved a work of art, you're a humanist and you're haunted. That's our kind of philanthropy. We give ourselves over to be haunted by the spirits of the past, to speak for distant people, people who are oppressed, people who are otherwise silenced, and who try in every way they can to speak to us and to make, their, make themselves heard. But this is hardly the time to be gloomy about it. There are some serious advantages to being haunted in this way. You have taught yourselves the languages of the world, and now you're capable not only of understanding your distant counterparts, but of speaking for them, and in some cases to them. You know much about the world and its past, and you can turn that knowledge to your advantage in any of a myriad of ways. You've trained yourselves in interpretation and critique and qualitative analysis, arts that any number of careers demand and reward. Because you've spent so much time haunted by literature and the arts, you're smart and you're cultured and you've learned the standards of superior written and spoken communication. You're excellent negotiators. You are excellent leaders if you devote yourselves to that art. You have a perspective on human aspiration that makes you versatile, inventive, and adaptable. Finally, you are protectors of the human. In a time when the most reliable sort of Hollywood blockbuster, from Terminator back in the day to Oblivion more recently, or any zombie movie you choose to see, 
any of these is going to feature the human race on the brink of destruction, whether by self-aware computers or by omnipotent aliens or by some other inhuman force. We seem to imagine this quite a lot. And you've trained yourselves as defenders of what it means to be human, as people who remember what it has always meant and what the different versions of humanity have been through the ages. And here, uh, since in my own research I'm a China scholar, I can't, resisting, I can't resist repeating a line that I shared also with last year's graduates. It's from one of my favorite early Chinese philosophical texts, the Zhuangzi, uh, a Taoist text probably from the third century BC or so. This thinker worried a great deal about the way that we can lose our humanity in the midst of our various technical and institutional inventions. And he urged us always, and forgive me, I'm going to insert a little Chinese here, and he urged us always to wu wu, or bu wu yi wu. It's a tongue twister in ancient Chinese too. Uh, <laughs> but what it means is, and this is worth a great deal of attention, to treat things as things and not to be made into a thing among things, that is to retain our humanity. What he demanded of us is that we remember whether we're in the midst of material comfort and technological advance or in poverty and deprivation, to remember that as human beings we are the free arbiters of value for ourselves. We humanize this world of ours and we do it by listening to each other and listening to the voices of the past. So whether you're headed for graduate school next, or for a year abroad, or for the world of work, or for a time of creative endeavor on your own, you go forth from UCLA with a special ability to be haunted by other human voices, to hear, to understand, to speak, and to humanize. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for this year, Catherine Glynn Benkheim. A distinguished alumna of the art history department, Catherine is an accomplished scholar, lecturer, and independent curator in the field of South Asian art. She's the author of many scholarly publications beginning more than 40 years ago with her work on painting from the Punjab Hills of Northern India, and continuing to this day with work on the painting collections of the royal families in Rajasthan. Catherine is currently working on future exhibitions with curators at the Art Institute of Chicago and the Cleveland Museum of Art. In addition to her professional endeavors, Catherine also serves on the board of the American Friends of the Israel Museum and is an emerita member of the board of the trustees of the Freer Sackler Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. She's an advisory board member of the UCLA William Andrews Clark Library and serves on the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Ancient Arch Arts Council, and South Asian Art Council, and the American Committee of South Asian Art. Catherine received a bachelor's degree from UC Santa Barbara, a master's degree from UCLA, and a doctorate from USC. <laughs> we are an eclectic bunch, and we accept knowledge from all sources. <laughs> a proud Bruin, and alumna of the humanities, Catherine has enlightened our students with her knowledge of art history by teaching undergraduates and graduate courses at UCLA. She has also taught courses at Cal State Long Beach and Northwestern University. I'm honored and delighted that Catherine has joined us again today for this momentous occasion. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Glynn Benkheim. Thank you, Dean Skaberg, trustees, distinguished faculty, friends, families, and especially you, the graduating class of 2013. It was an honor to be asked to speak to you, the graduating class, in the humanities at UCLA in 2013. In fact, it was more than an honor. It was a complete surprise. So why did they ask Catherine Glenn Benkheim to come back and speak to you about some thoughts on living? Okay, I'm a UCLA supporter, 
I support my passion, the William Andrews Clark Memorial Library, where some of the great concerts of the, of the West Coast can be heard in a wonderful 1926 building. The concerts at the Clark are so popular that we have to establish a lottery system in order to have tickets for the 100 seats that are available. Contributions, such as mine, allow us to keep the ticket price at a very, very reasonable $25. And I love going to the Fowler and coming here to Royce Hall, which I have been coming to for about 55 years. I know the Hall is older than I am, but I have been coming here for 55 years. The Hammer Museum and the Billy Wilder Theater, these are all exciting parts of my life. And they are also part of the wide-ranging cultural life that UCLA provides for Los Angeles. After I graduated, I never forgot the how important UCLA was to my own love of art, and in particular, to my wonderful, wonderful life after getting my master's degree from UCLA. Now, what would a commencement speech be without some lessons for life? So the title of this speech is My Lives and Lessons. Lesson number one. You can't pick your parents. You can't pick when or where you entered this world. So adjust to the fact that you cannot control everything. I was born in Los Angeles and grew up in Studio City. So I'm an original Valley girl. And had I not been born here, perhaps I never would have attained, attended UCLA. Who knows? Lesson number two, there are things you can control. Even though I hadn't majored in art history as an undergraduate, I came to the chairman of the art history department here at UCLA because I wanted to do graduate work in the field. He said he would let me come in for a trial period. I decided if he was going to give me a trial period, I was going to give him a trial period and he happened to teach South Asian art. So I took his courses. I was accepted. I studied hard. I completed my degree. I graduated. I went on. There are doors that seem closed that you can open with a certain amount of persistence and real desire if you really, really want to. Lesson three, all that schooling that is part of this room right now, all the schooling that you've done and that I've done and that many of you are going to go on and do further work. Lesson number three is that the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now I know the last should be changed to a digital age word that begins with R, but you get my point. These three are the absolute tools for you for the future. Can you write persuasively? Can you read analytically and critically? That's what I would want to know if I were going to hire you for anything, and then it would be very lucky you. And I hope that's what your professors have done for and with you. If they have, then like me, you can be proud and thankful that you received your degree from UCLA here today. Lesson four, sex. Okay, I have your attention now, but we're not going to go too deeply into lesson four. We're going to move on to lesson five. Lesson five is to be ready to take advantage of all the new opportunities when you can and be open for, for when they happen. For they will happen, I guarantee you. When I was a beginning graduate student here at UCLA, 
I went to a reception, a cocktail reception, for the new South Asian curator at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. He offered, and I took a job working for him in the curatorial department at LACMA. I got married, and my husband was a collector of Persian and Indian paintings. So I became a collector as well, and I love, love, love collecting. And the, uh, my collections are now the focus of our lives. After LACMA, I was offered a job to start the, American, the West Coast chapter of the American Friends of the Israel Museum in development. I took the job. I had a fabulous time working that job. And because of my background, if somebody wanted to donate art instead of money for the Israel Museum, I was in the perfect position to analyze that art and decide whether to take it for the museum or not. The Israel Museum in Jerusalem is one of the great encyclopedic museums in the world, and I was very privileged to be a part of it. I taught classes at universities that needed non-Western courses. All along, I kept doing scholarly publishing under Catherine Glynn, under my maiden name, under my UCLA name. And you know what I love best? I love it when a young colleague now comes to me and asks for help, and I love giving back. So, lesson number five, you will probably have way more jobs in your life, way more professions and professional opportunities than you can even imagine right now. Take advantage of those opportunities and be open for when they come your way. Lesson six, change happens. The world has expanded. Communication has exploded. Friends have moved away. Friends have moved back, and sadly, they have died. Borders of countries that I thought were fixed aren't even on maps any longer. GPS tracking shows us how to find the nearest coffee shop, and it's probably showing a drone up in the air right now exactly where we are here in Royce Hall at UCLA. On the one hand, we know so much. On the other, we are aware of how much we will never know. Fields of study that we thought were complete have been turned upside down. Sculptures and paintings in museums turn out to have been stolen or looted from their countries of origin or taken from families escaping death during a war and now have to be returned. Perhaps the greatest album of paintings from the Mughal dynasty, made for one of the great Mughal emperors, now rests in Tehran, in Iran, a country that didn't even exist when the Mughal ateliers created these dazzling paintings. And sadly, these album paintings are not going to come to the United States for you to see, because various countries share more antagonisms than they do community. So when a group of these leaves came to Switzerland recently for an exhibition, I hopped on a plane and spent four days with my magnifying glass marveling. But that is a lecture for another day. Change happens. After 27 years of marriage, my husband died in 2001. Seven years later, I remarried to my now partner, a terrific, accomplished, fantastic woman. Who knew? Thank you, California. Thanks to all of you who support marriage equality. Thank you. Change happens, and if you are ready, and courageous, and you've learned all the other lessons, you will be able to recognize it, and go with it, and take advantage of it, and change yourselves. Risky business, this life. 
these lives of ours. Yes, change happens, and if you are as fortunate as I've been, the past will be one of the best tools for you for your future. Starting in 1970, I made trip after trip after trip all over the world, and I took photographs everywhere, and I made those photographs, they were, they were slides in those days. And there are about a half a dozen of us here in the, uh, in the Western world who have images of Indian paintings. And we're doing our best now to get those online so that you and your colleagues can all have access to them too. One of the values of spending a long time learning in a field is that we have seen so much. When a museum is looted in Afghanistan, for example, it is the art historian who was there who can tell you what is missing now. It is the art historian with a photo who can tell the auction house that a piece has been stolen and should not be for sale. It is the art historian who can tell a dealer who sends a JPEG of something that they would like to sell that that painting was hanging on the walls of a museum in Kashmir in 1976. But that is a story that will not be told at a later date. That is something that the prudent art historian just uses as an example of the value of learning over time. Lesson seven and eight and nine. Who knows? I have a future ahead of me, and I expect that during that future, I will learn what lessons seven, eight, and nine are all about. In the meantime, it's time for you to learn your own lessons. Thank you for letting me share mine, and be generous with yours. Your pursuit of a degree in humanities means that you're going to be contributing to a more humane world. And remember how I started a few minutes ago with my own contributions to my UCLA passions? Be assured that they're all going to ask you at some date for you to support your passions. Say yes when you can, and congratulations to you all.